Hello, hello. We should be live right now. <laughs> uh, hello and welcome to our inaugural, inaugural Horace's Young Visionaries panel. My name is Joncha Brackman and I will be your moderator for the coming hour and a half. We had to split the session into two parts. So if you want to stay on for both parts, you'll have to switch over with me to part two after 45 minutes. This session was supposed to be a first real life reception in Cascais at the end of March uh, at the global Horasis meeting. But I hope some of you have poured yourselves a drink and we can host a cozy virtual reception together right now. Please chime in in the comments if you have any ideas. We probably won't have time for Q&A, but this is only the first session of which I'm sure many will follow. So who am I? I am the founder of Impact Shakers, which is an impact entrepreneurship ecosystem. It consists of a startup studio in which we work with impact startups one-on-one. -on -one. We have an online community and we have online courses. And all of this is aimed at bridging the gap between impact and profit and making entrepreneurship more diverse. Today in this session, uh, we will get to explore some of the first ideas uh, for Horace's Young Visionaries community and maybe even fellowship. In order to do this, we have invited a number of very enthusiastic and engaged mission-driven entrepreneurs and young leaders, and I would love for you to get to know them. And we'll kick off with an introductory round. Um, Abilasha, would you like to start? Sure. Okay, so hello everyone. Um, first of all, thank you for inviting me, Dr. Richter and Horace's community. Um, so my name is Abhilasha Bhatia. I'm the founder and CEO of the Creators Dev Hub. Uh, it's a technology solutions consulting and development firm. Um, and we have a mission to uh, drive the uh, advancement of technology forward, mainly among small businesses. And we also envision a world where humans are inspired by and delve themselves into creative pursuits. Currently, we are having, like, we conduct many educational webinars on different software as a service solutions for um, different small uh, enterprises to medium sized enterprises. And yeah, I'm looking forward to engaging in further discussion. Thank you, Abilasha. Um, Ashish, would you like to continue? Yes, namaste everyone. I'm Ashish Chauhan. I'm here in Delhi, uh, actually based out of Mumbai. I am National Organizing Secretary of Akhil Bharatiya Vidyarthi Parishad. That's a student's organization. We are working as a uh, among students as students' rights group, and we are passionate about uh, education policy, youth, and uh, the present pandemic has given us a unique opportunity to delve upon uh, how the employment, other issues will be uh, dealt with in coming days. So it's part education policy, parts uh, about employment we are working upon right now. In the longer run, it's uh, deliberation upon how we are uh, working for students' cause, how we are taking them through the social issues and working for the national life. That is particularly uh, we are passionate about in uh, uh, ABVP. Particularly, I would like to thank you for uh, this uh, uh, wonderful discussion. And Dr. Richter had uh, actually proposed this uh, beautiful plan. And obviously, we would like to engage with this discussion further. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Anya? Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Anya Sharan, and I currently live in New Delhi, India. Uh, currently, I serve as a customer success and marketing manager at Metric Stream, uh, which is a governance, risk, and compliance technology leader. And I also serve as a director of Aura Inc., uh, prior to this, I worked in the enterprise risk management consulting space at Deloitte in New York, uh, prior to which I was it at NYU Stern School of Business for Finance and Accounting, and I'm very excited to be here. Thanks. Helen, take the mic. <laughs> 
Hi, everyone. My name is Helen Lukundo Chonjo. I'm joining from Tanzania. I am the founder and managing partner at Matra Justice. It is an insurance um, claims management firm, and we work to create solutions for the insurance industry in, in Tanzania, particularly working with um, underprivileged individuals, making sure that they get um, their compensation. Um, those who maybe by reason of poverty or um, lack of education cannot um, fund um, or make their claims on their own. So we come in to assist. I'm also um, passionate about education and social change. And so I am an educator um, and I'm also a social entrepreneur, um, a friend for um, of a lot of for profit and social impact businesses here in Africa, energy and other spaces. I'm happy to be here and happy to contribute. Very cool. Thank you. Shiraz? Um, of course. So um, I'm English born, Swiss raised with Indian, Pakistani and Kenyan ancestry. Um, my passion for business first took me to Lancaster University and the Universidad Pontificia de Comillas to study a four-year dual Bachelor of Business Administration with honors. And it was there that I really found my passion for innovation within one of the largest and, and fastest um, industries in, in the world that is, is really coming up now, which is blockchain um, technology. So I first started off by doing research, which first then moved on to investment and then asset management. But my real leap uh, into the world of digital assets came with my role as mark marketing lead of Smart Valor, so a Swiss-based blockchain startup set to build a decentralized marketplace for tokenized alternative investments, um, whereby currently I'm an advisor uh, to Jur, a leading tech startup pursuing the vision of creating a decentralized legal ecosystem, and to Yoke Network, a revolutionary influencer-driven marketing platform. And so additionally, now I drive growth and collaboration across the global blockchain economy through my role as head of business development at the Crypto Valley Association. Um, furthermore, I'm persistent on educating world leaders and global audiences on the future of blockchain technology via executive personalized courses at renowned uh, venues such as the University of Geneva and also um, here today. However, what I'd like to further uh, discuss during this panel involves my role as Chief Operating Officer of Katerina, a revolutionary medical software that facilitates the lives of all that interact within the healthcare ecosystem. So thanks to the sheer, let's say, brilliance and, and hard work over the past two and a half years of our team, Katerina is now able to offer more medical time to health professionals, closer patient follow-up, and better clinical um, decision-making. So our core aim is to put you, the, the patient, at the center of your own health, because um, your, your health can never be too important, all right? And, and especially within the current times we're facing. So well, all, all in all, my involvement in these activities mean that I don't get so much uh, sleep, um, but I believe that a, a life worth living is one that is dreamt uh, wide awake. So I'm very happy to, to be here to discuss um, all of these issues with you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Shiraz. Uh, Marco, please share some of your... Thank you, Yoncha. Um, firstly, I apologize, guys, for the blurry uh, screen. I'm having some technical issues here in the Philippines and using a laptop, I think, from the previous century. So um, I hope you can hear me better than, than you can see me. Um, so, yeah, I'm joining you from the Philippines, uh, where I have a, a non-for-profit organization that started about eight years ago. We initially started with play-based education, targeting those that are marginalized, vulnerable, or otherwise uh, outside of quality education. Uh, and we've been doing that, working with the Ministry of Education for a number of years. Um, uh, but I would say in the last three months, uh, we've pivoted somewhat to becoming a now a humanitarian organization responding with relief efforts and uh, helping families that have been now locked down for more than 100 days uh, in the Philippines. So, um, yeah, excited to be here and hopefully looking forward to creating a virtual ruckus with some other change makers. Thank you, Marco. Will you mute yourself? <laughs>
because there is some yeah background noise um and then i would like to start uh with you anya um with the question uh what do you believe could be the strongest asset uh the horasis community has to offer for horasis young visionaries because you know the network quite well um so please share with us your ideas Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so I think it's extraordinary that we've got such a great group together today. Uh, you know, so many individuals passionate about so many different causes with, you know, diverse experiences all over the world. Um, and I think all of us are just getting together and we want to make an impact on the world. We want to question the way things are done. Uh, we want to move forward. We want to contribute, uh, you know, and at the same time, learn and grow as well. Um, so I think, you know, we're all here with this common intent. Um, and I really believe that Harassus is a great platform to do that. Um, you know, being involved with it for the last couple of years, um, I think one of the strongest and one of the best things that I've seen about Harassus is, you know, its members who are, of course, you know, knowledgeable and world leaders and, you know, business leaders, et cetera, um, are very close to the Harassus community. Um, so I've noticed that, you know, members who tend to attend the events every year tend to come back. They tend to stay connected, you know, throughout the year. So that provides a really close-knit and intimate network, which I think would be great for us, um, you know, to leverage and to learn from, uh, to build mentorships with, um, you know, to collaborate with them on projects. The network is also really diverse and wide. Um, so we also have the opportunity to actually connect on different verticals based on both our interests, our skills. Um, you know, we can align ourselves in areas where we want to grow. We can collaborate on projects where we think we can actually provide, um, you know, our skills, but also learn. Um, and then, you know, also great, get great opportunities in various organizations. So I think, you know, definitely the mentorship angle and the ability to collaborate on different projects is probably going to be invaluable. Um, the other thing that I think is also something which is great about Harassus, you know, and has consistently been so, um, is that, you know, the network um, is not only focused on one um, country or one region like India, but there's different meetings, you know, the China meeting, the Asia meeting, the global meeting, there's so many meetings across the world. Um, and I think that's great because we have access then, you know, to networks and resources and opportunities all over the world um, where we can, you know, not only contribute uh, in the regions that we're present in, but, you know, make connections and, um, you know, learn from each other like we are today on the panel. Um, and then also, you know, from so many, uh, so many networks and so many uh, leaders all over the world. So I really think that these are, you know, some of the key ways um, in which Harassus can certainly help us and we can certainly be a part of it. And it's just a great community to be a part of. That sounds so exciting. <laughs> um, Marco, do you want to uh, pick in on that? Sure. Um, um, yeah, so... Can you still hear background noise? Is it is it really is it really interfering with the microphone? It is pretty bad, but it yeah, goes up and down. Let's try. Ah, you're gonna try to change then. Ah. Wait. Is it better? It might be. <laughs> it? Can you hear it still? Yeah. Okay. It's better when you put your microphone in. Can you hear me now? Yes. Keep talking. Okay. <laughs> Guys, I, I'm having personal crisis here with my uh, technology, so forgive me. Uh, I, I'm in a remote part of the Philippines. Um, just just to follow on, I think yes, I, I I agree. I agree completely. You know, I've been part of the Harassus network for the last number of years. Um, I think the 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 physical meetings are a great space where people have really the freedom to express uh, innovative, disruptive ideas. So I think up until now, it's a, it's a network that I've certainly enjoyed and benefited from, especially as there's obviously a very experienced cohort of business leaders. And for us, I think, you know, some of those people are 
are perhaps people that we look up to, um, companies that we want to work with. So I think it's it's an exciting network to be part of. Um, you know, and I would say that as much as we can benefit from that existing network, I think the young young leaders has just as much to offer, if not more, given what's happening in the world. I think this is a very um, you know, this this whole pandemic has exposed a lot of fault lines in the current systems. And I think in the past, existing leaders have used our naivety and our youthful recklessness um, to kind of dismiss some of these disruptive ideas. So I think and I hope really that we have a lot of confidence by what is going on. And if I can say that the mess that's happening all over the world by elected leaders and business leaders who are not exactly coming up with any um, workable solutions. So I think there's a great urgency for young people to really take charge of this crisis and really have a lot more confidence in proposing new ideas um, because we're seeing for a very long time in the industry I'm in that existing solutions are not actually solving some of these ills that we're seeing, whether it's social inequality, poverty, racial tension that's happening now in America. Um, I think it's just a perfect opportunity for young people to really, I wouldn't just say make change, but really come together. I think that that's what I would like to see in this network, really a, a coordination of young people working towards a common goal. I think sometimes we're very driven by our own personal visions, and sometimes that can be a detriment because we have our own tunnel visions. So if we can somehow coalesce all this energy and come together for for a, for a united vision, I think that there's a lot of potential we have to offer. Thank you, Marco. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, Abilasha, who or what has helped you the most in advancing your mission so far? Sure. So um, reflecting back on my education career and now this entrepreneurship journey, um, I feel like I should like there are many multiple facets, definitely. And I have come to where I am by definitely standing on the shoulders of giants. Those giants have been my family who has been like really supportive um, during my upbringing. I kind of felt like, by the way, I am tuning in from Toronto, Canada. So I kind of like after seeing all of these, um, after doing my education, higher education in US and working across US and Canada, I kind of feel my upbringing was very much in a conservative environment. But I think one thing was very um, constant um, back in India also was that um, there was a culture of progressive thoughts and education was always the focus. So definitely my family was uh, a crucial uh, element in my mission and throughout this journey. And then the mentors that I've had uh, the opportunity to work with, they have been in the form of senior software engineers, they have been in the form of my managers, um, and they have all given me really um, valuable knowledge nuggets, which I have been able to uh, implement throughout this journey. And then um, the community. Um, as we are reflecting on this, um, like how how can the younger generation be catalyst for change? Um, I would really like to advise, uh, like whoever is tuning in among, um, even like if you have kids who are in uh, in the college education. Um, um, I would really want to give this particular advice as to connect yourselves with communities. Those communities can be associated with any hobbies, with uh, your career development or with a social service or a social cause. But the importance of communities would be that you will be able to share knowledge and resources. You would be able to form connections that would help you down the road. And also it will help you in um, not really feeling isolated. You would feel connected to a particular cause. And that would actually bring you together in your um, future journey. You can always take some or the other thing from the communities that you've been associated with. And one of 
Um, the other advice that I would want to give to the parents who are tuning in now or who would be watching this um, particular video streaming is that um, uh, I know times are hard. These are COVID times. And um, whatever socioeconomic background you have, try to create an environment of psychological safety for your children because um, that, uh, that definitely encourages, that gives them um, um, and basically a, a sight to be hopeful. And, um, and if you have that environment of hope, you can actually um, encourage and children can actually thrive with positive thinking, which is a very key element in building grit. And henceforward, in like taking initiatives and that leadership approach. So yeah, it has been basically, yeah, my family, the mentors and the communities that I've been associated with. Thank you, those are some beautiful words. Um, and did you have a particular project in mind that would be great to collaborate on? Sure, so I have been um, basically researching about grassroots entrepreneurship and um, specifically in emerging markets. So for example, there was a, a community in Tanzania who um, actually built um, um, a 3D printer out of e-waste and they are commercializing it uh, now. And uh, then in, in India, like back in my hometown of Kanpur, um, there were two engineers who actually came together to recycle, uh, basically upcycle the flower waste and in India flower waste is uh, a lot because uh, because we use it um, in in temples a lot and in like many different ceremonies so they basically uh, brought together a strategy of upcycling it and they have successfully transferred it into like um, incense sticks and they're even making some biodegradable uh, thermocol material and leather going forward so one of the projects that I would want uh, the Horasis community to come together is to um, encourage and boost local entrepreneurship because when local entrepreneurship will be boosted, it would be like, uh, it's, it's a chain reaction. And what they are doing is that they are also employing um, the locals. Um, it can be in the form of migrant workers who are coming for, for, for opportunities, even for, um, um, for the jobs that don't really require um, high education or um, that don't really require much skill. Um, so, for example, the entrepreneurship, uh, the entrepreneurs that I'm mentioning about from my hometown, they are actually employing women from low socioeconomic background. They are training them to sort those flowers out and do these different uh, operations. And then they're also making sure that they help and um, so they are provided for uh, for the health insurance and other um, necessities that don't really um, in any other operations you won't uh, like in any other specific jobs that they would do they won't really be um, uh, getting these particular perks over there right so uh, specifically um, um, people who are coming out with uh, ingenious ideas and to also have a vision to drive it forward um, with sustainability in mind. Um, yeah, one of my requests from the Rasus community would be to like I can uh, my my uh, my role in that would be to basically see how can technology help and bridge that gap because now everyone has smartphones, everyone has. Um, technologies to support and connect with each other. So if there is a way to connect and boost local entrepreneurship and to connect these local entrepreneurs, even across, across boundaries for knowledge and resources, yeah, that would be something I would be really uh, looking forward to participating with. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Ashish, could you tell us what you're most passionate about and why and how this network could help you advance your mission? Thank you, uh, Yoncha. Particularly, I have mentioned uh, it is uh, education and youth, which I'm uh, really passionate about. And as far as uh, I would like to divide this uh, into two halves. I do have uh, uh, a fine experience with professional fellows 
by Department of State in the U.S., where we have this unique opportunity to work with, collaborate with uh, fellows from all across the globe. I, I would like to actually see, um, this is my first time with Horasis, and uh, I would, I'm very hopeful, and I've interacted with you and Dr. Victor and uh, some of the fellows here in the in Mumbai, and particularly it will be engaging uh, with like-minded people who are working in uh, youth domain or they are working in education domain and sharing ideas, policy points, and how they are working with society there in their countries. Obviously, when it comes to India, it, it is it has to be that scale. It has to be either China, it has to be either uh, Indonesia, Brazil, US. These countries of scale per se, where we would like to see how what kind of changes are being done. So one part is that I would like to interact with this set of community and Horasis for that matter is a wonderful opportunity for me as well as uh, people who are working in an organization to interact with these uh, finest people uh, who are studying, who are working, who are researching upon these things or working with society in this grassroots level. Secondly, I, as far as India's uh, education and policy domain is concerned, we, we see this unique opportunity which is talked about uh, about India's potential for 21st century uh, because we have a uh, like demographic dividend and uh, the average age is like 29, 30, whereas China is 37, Japan is 47, and many of the European countries are uh, in, in uh, late 40s and 50s. Particularly, if we want to tap into this talent, it has to be uh, the higher education, it has to be education right from the school level to the higher education, skilling which is being propagated by the present government in a big way. But the task at hand is enormous. Uh, I was listening to one of the presentation of then uh, the founder or the first minister for uh, skilling in 2014. He said he has a task to train 500 billion people. That's huge. 50 crore people you want to train. So particularly education domain comes in picture. We don't have a system like US where you have community colleges, but we have colleges. Those are 40,000 colleges here in India. We have 990 universities. We have 11,000 standalone institutes. Those standalone institutes are the very institute which actually train people into technology or all these sorts of things. So there was this uh, committee called the Knowledge Commission, which said in 2007 that we need 1500 university. At present, if I have to dwell upon this idea, the present national education policy, which was stable last year, draft national education policy to 2019, it actually speaks about how these institutions are to be upgraded into a bigger scale. I would like to give you a one small fact. Uh, if I may ask my fellow panelists, which is the country which has biggest higher education network in the world? So straight away, we'll think it's China. We might think it's US. In terms of most number of higher education institutes in the world, it is India. We have 62,000 higher education institutes as far as uh, baccalaureates, that is 10 plus 2, 12. That is 1 lakh 12,000 uh, uh, institutions. If you put all these together, it goes 1 lakh 65,000 institutes above the standard 10. Or the, uh, that many institutions are here. And when we see in comparison, China comes second and US comes third. But when you put in perspective, how many graduates, how many PhDs we produce, we go in a third number. Because in India, per higher education institute, we train only 650 students in one higher education institute. What we are propagating in our organization, which I am really passionate about, is we should increase the minimum number of students studying in a higher education institute. There was a research done by Professor Morris of IIM Ahmedabad, he particularly said that we can increase our strength because we are working in a limited capacity in terms of how many students, how many uh, uh, people can train within an institution. There is a university which has uh, the area I'm, I'll be speaking in acres. So it is 2,700 acres and they have uh, uh, two students, like the, the ratio is so enormously uh, uh, miscalculated that uh, in terms of University of uh, Columbia, where they have 
uh, 15,000 plus stu uh, students within a small space, we are not utilizing our uh, like infrastructure, like uh, land mass, and it has to be done. And in coming times, all these things are to be utilized for taking these facilities onto a newer level. That's why the national education policy speaks about putting up a bar of minimum 2,000 students in a higher education institute that they are calling colleges. And in coming days, probably these colleges will get uh, that autonomy and they will be able to award degrees. But I personally, uh, I'm passionate or speak about cluster universities. So it, put, it has to be these final colleges should come together. They should make up a university. And by virtue of which, these 40,000 colleges could uh, club together into making a more number of university though uh, it won't limit at 1500 right now it might go above but we don't need a uh, more number of colleges we would like to integrate our systems uh, i come from uh, uh, north of india but i stay in mumbai some of the finest institutes are only two kilometers three kilometers in south mumbai tata institute of uh, fundamental research one of the finest physics and mathematics institute it's there and there is a law uh, uh, institute uh, government law college there is one of the finest uh, humanities college st xavier's there is a management college jbims which is there there is a finest uh, management commerce colleges so what we want to propose is there is there is a earlier integration and in the coming days it has to go for, further this is how uh, uh, we are uh, interacting with policymakers, talking to academicians, and in coming days, I would like to have ideas from harasses community, people who are working in the academic field in these beautiful places across the globe. So this is it from my side. I'm really passionate about it, and you can uh, get all this <laughs> from my <laughs> point. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ashish. I have a, a quick question for you. Um, no, do you. Do you have contacts? at the national policy level then or is this for example something oh, yeah, yeah. We, yeah. Uh, we 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 present our uh, uh, during this pandemic itself we have written to the prime minister we have written to the uh, minister of hrd it's been three uh, like letters we have presented our opinion and in coming days obviously we would be writing upon all these issues and uh, with my organization i'm very much active in uh, these policy domain whenever we feel that these are the things we want to speak up to the education is or policy organization, whether it is the university systems here in India. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we'll uh, get to you, Helen. Um, what did I want to ask you? Um, a very similar question. What are you most passionate about and why? And who has helped you advance your mission the most? Okay. Um, well, as far as passion is concerned, um, I'm most passionate about service and support for human advancement. So I am, in a way, I would say I'm passionate about people. And then I'm passionate about service and support because I feel that that is what is most needed in order to advance. Coming from um, a continent such as Africa, resources is really not much of a problem <laughs> because we, we are blessed with quite a lot. However, um, it is our mindset that needs transformation, um, and that's what I believe in. And so service, when I say service and support, it is in form of information, in form of knowledge and connections, um, actually, to um, change mindsets, to let um, our people know what they don't know. Because I believe um, if someone knows something differently, they act differently. And sometimes um, our lack of advancement of, or slow progression is because of poor access um, to information, poor access to knowledge, um, poor access to connections. Um, and so, yes, in a nutshell, for me, it is service and support at the core and um, people wrapped all around it. Um, it is uh, people and more specifically youth. Um, I believe in youth <laughs> because they are the ones that carrying the flag and that will advance um, our continent and um, our world for the future. And um, 
yeah, that, that would answer the first question um, to begin with. And um, you asked me the second question, advancing my mission so far and what has helped me. Again, it is the same thing. It's people um, in terms of individual people, uh, communities, and networks, starting from home where my parents were a support system and it is again the information they gave me the knowledge they gave me uh the connections i have had that made my dreams and my dreams of helping other people come true in terms of um, connections and networks i would say um it boils down to school connections and goes all the way up to opportunities that you have as a business and as an individual um, last year, I got a chance to go to a fellowship, um, Mandela Washington Fellowship. It's a U.S. based. And, um, out of that came a network from 20 African countries where there were different fellows. And because of that, in a span of what is less than a year now, I have been able to advance my cause so much further just because I have a network of people who now we can work together and collaborate because again, one thing that I'm big on is collaboration. I feel that is the new innovation. <laughs> and so it boils down to people. It boils down to support and service and people in forms of individuals and then people, people in forms of networks, people in form of uh, communities and further just people who are willing to go the extra mile. So yeah. Quick follow-up question. You said you got the chance to collaborate with these um, people from uh, more than 20 countries. Could you yeah. give an example on how you collaborated? Okay. So coming back from the fellowship, I tapped into the educator part of me. And so I started a company called Bora International um, with the goal of advancing um, youth. Again, with those three pillars, um, knowledge, information, and um, connections. And so I'm working with fellows from uh, Kenya right now um, to be able to roll out programs for um, career preparation and uh, youth advancement. And I am also serving as a strategist as well, some of the other businesses, again, in Kenya and in Zimbabwe, um, all that in light of pushing um, things forward. I found that we were like-minded, and so we just put the cause together, and it became bigger. So instead of individual people doing nuggets, it's now bigger because we get to roll the same idea in different countries, and our challenges are the same, and so it is just faster. Something that I couldn't do over the years, I was able to do in And you froze. That's really sad. <laughs> um, and now you left. But that was a really exciting explanation. So um, Helen collaborated on a concrete project. Um, and then I would like to ask you, Shiraz, um, what is your mission and what has helped you the most so far? Um, uh, we've heard of it. Choose one. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so what, what is my mission? I think I think that's a, a great a great question. And, and defining your mission is hard. Dedicating your life to a sole purpose at a young age is not something to take lightly, especially in the world in which we live in today, right? So, I mean, where there's an abundance of information uh, at one's fingertips, we must spend the appropriate amount of time to understand all we can before determining our trajectory. I mean, there's also an, another valid option um, with within this, um, it, and it's it's the path that, that I've chosen subconsciously to follow over the years is to define a core set of fundamentals, ethics and morals, which you stand by fully and let your cleared vision guide you towards your mission, um, which could be something you discover five, 10, 20, 50 years down the line when you realize, wow, that was it. That was my purpose of being my mission. And um, I think luck or karma has a lot to play in our lives, whereby in my opinion, if you, if you stubbornly try to define your future in a planned, calculated way without the open-mindedness of change, you're, you're bound to fail. Fail, may, maybe not in terms of your end goal or mission in this case, but in terms of what that objective was supposed to ultimately bring you. I mean, personally, for example, 
I don't believe that I would have found my passion for the trifecta of finance, technology, and healthcare if I had set myself the mission to do so before starting university. I had no real predetermined objectives other than absorbing my surroundings and learning as much as I could from them and intrinsically then about myself, in addition to letting my curiosity get the best of me um, at times. And, and I believe that today's society is too focused on achieving individual missions, hitting that next milestone, regardless of the impact it may have. For us to grow together in a post-COVID-19 world, we need to come together in terms um, of, the, of the change we want to make instead of letting it um, divide us. And so we, we as so-called young visionaries have a crucial role to play in this, whereby we are responsible for the impact of the change to come. Um, and we can, we can help define the path so, so society takes, be it towards a more digitized future that still enables high levels of social interconnectivity or one that prioritizes creativity in our day-to-day -day lives. So as I look towards what has helped me the most advancing towards my potential mission throughout the years, it would not be what, more like who, a collective of whose. It has been fundamentally been the people around me that gave way to the inspiration that I have today of doing my part in creating a better world. That is not to say that all these people put in the long hours for me, but we, we as social beings need to collaborate together. Our impact is greater together than apart. So in, in, in my opinion, there's a reason that there are two eyes uh, in mission. Uh, they are not limited to one person. We should share common goals to help each other brighten the future ahead. The, the world would be such an awesome place if we ultimately made it our mission, not my mission. That was awesome, Shiraz, really. Um, I love, I'm, I'm so happy uh, to begin with that I got to know all of you a bit. I feel very privileged um, and already this is uh, one of the things uh, Harassis has brought us um, and I look forward uh, to continuing the discussion with all of you um, on these subjects and I will check in with you again after this to um, make sure that I get your ideas right um, because there were so many beautiful ideas in here and I would like to uh, share them with the world afterwards as well. Um, and I hope to see you in the next panel uh, to which I will be moving on right now. Um, so thank you, everybody. Um, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Glad to be here.